Hello, amigos, amigas. Bienvenidos. Welcome to Lima, Peru. Once again, welcome to my home. Here, Vanessa, your Lima City Tour Guide, always with some new series and events. I want you to learn more of my country, of my city, from different angles, not just the history, the beautiful history of Peru, not just about the Incas, the Spanish conquest, the multiculturality, not just about the wonderful food that sometimes we cook together here in my house. Also, I like to bring to the table controversial topics. And in this new series, we are going to talk about unsolved and famous crimes, contemporary crimes here of Peru, Peruvian crimes that touch the hearts of many Peruvians. And in some cases, people from all over the world that wanted to, to learn what happened with this case, uh, with these missing people. So every time you're going to see this event on, we're going to talk about a different case, a different criminal case. I know sometimes they are called cold cases. This one in particular, I wanted to start with this one because it's not, to be honest, completely unsolved. There is a verdict about it, but if you ask to any Peruvian about this famous case that happened some years ago, they will not agree with the final resulting, with the justice brought. So before we begin, let me say hi to the people joining. Sorry, I was not attending too much the conversation. Just want to give an introduction. And also now it's time as always to say hi to all my friends joining. Uh, thanks so much for coming. And by the way, if you are new to my channel or maybe new to Hago, please receive a warm welcome Hago into this beautiful community uh, and into, well, my channel here in Lima, Peru. Hola, Helen, Diane, querida. Hola, Jan, Cindy, Connie, Larry, SK, Ann. Hola, Karim. Hola, Len. Thanks for coming. Hola, Christy, Sarah, Emily, Wendy, Casey. Thanks for visiting, amiga. Hola, Leta G. Hola, hola. Hello. Thanks for coming to Lima, amigos. Kelly, Philippe. Uh, hola, Terry. Uh, thanks for coming. And as you know already, we're going to talk about unsolved crimes and crimes that are, in some cases, cold cases, right? So, Camanelli, hola, que tal, amigo, Cynthia. Uh, and if you have any question, if you want to maybe comment during the tour, uh, I love it. No problem. No problem about it. If you want to, let's say, uh, talk here with, with some of your friends, here we are in a community. We are uh, in, in family. Um, so you can use here the chat. If you have a question for me, Please, and if you see the chat is very active, please use the queue at the beginning or a question at the beginning so I know the question is for me so I can address it. Uh, I will be also checking the chat constantly. Uh, and also would like to uh, thank also to anyone who is able to donate and, and help this channel to continue bringing events, uh, historic events, city tours, um, any type of, of activity that you want to support, like for example, this type of new events, uh, maybe you want to do it through a tip. Thank you so much in advance because it helps me, not just you know your guy, me in this case, or any guy you support here on Hago, any of your favorite guides, it also helps Hago itself because Hago uh, is is a uh, let's say a, a platform that is free to join. Every tour is free to watch. So the only way we can support this wonderful initiative is by donating because a percentage of all the donations or even the sponsorship program, which at the end I will explain what it is, will help them to continue being a free platform. Hola Terry, Mwah. thanks for visiting. Hola, hola. So now. It is time, I think we are all here ready to begin with new. And it is about unsolved crimes, Peruvian unsolved crimes, that um, cause, you know, like a 
incredible sensations in the people of Peru. This one in particular, it touched me deeply because um, in some cases, well, I, I was able to find myself in situations in which I felt I could be one of the uh, participants of this story. So now I will turn off the light and prepare also for your questions. So we have the chance to chat, you know, better during this event. Uh, so we are going now and with this mysterious music, we're going to talk about uh, this famous crime, uh, almost considered an unsolved case because most of the Peruvian population didn't feel that the verdict was right, actually. Uh, so this is the story of the mysterious disappearance of Ciro Castillo. 200 days lost in Colca Canyon. So first of all, to give you an idea about the time when this happened, it was 2011 when this couple uh, of uh, say very young youthful students of a university in Lima, uh, adventurous people who actually were in a, in a field, studying a field that connected them a lot to nature. They were, I would say, a, a middle upper class also couple. Um, they disappear in a place that is very famous uh, in Peru in, in, as a touristic destination called Colca Canyon, located in Arequipa. Maybe you know about Arequipa uh, very well from our friend Elizabeth Puma, our guide, our Hago guide in Arequipa. So let's begin presenting the, the two people uh, who are going to be the center of this case, of this story. So first of all, we have uh, Rosario Ponce, a young girl in her early 20s, a student of the University La Molina Agrarian. Uh, this university is specialized in everything related with nature, uh, different, let's say, professions that you can learn there are connected with, you know, going out to the field. So most of the people who are uh, students of that university love nature, love trekking, love adventure, right? So Rosario Ponce uh, comes from a family, as I said before, of well-off uh, people, right? Um, and it was the same case with Ciro Castillo. Ciro Castillo uh, uh, also was one student in the same classroom of Rosario Ponce, they were friends of, of some time. No? Um, actually, they had oh, uh, other relations oh, in, in, the, in the classroom and before, previously, right? Uh, they were just another, you know, juvenile couple, right? And they shared their passion for trekking, for adventure. Also, Ciro Castillo comes from a upper class family, middle upper class family. Uh, his father is a doctor, right? Um, so these elements are important for us to understand what happened later in the story, right? Of course, that the case mm, uh, that we're going to present little by little will, um, let's say, untangle certain elements that we will set when the moment comes, of course. Uh -huh. This is one of the few pictures that we can find online about Ciro Castillo and Rosario Ponce in the days when they were just students of the university, having fun with friends. They were first friends and then later decided to go ahead with a relation of boyfriend, girlfriend. Gracias, Pam. Gracias, Eli. So, of course, many people oh, that passes through oh, the classrooms of the universities, oh, they, they find similar things, you know, with others. And it starts relations, oh, nothing really out of the ordinary, right? So, 
Now we have to go to the beginning of the end, I will say, in a way. Hola, Marianne. Thanks for coming. If you are just coming no, to this point of the story, we are just beginning, by the way. We are talking about the case of Ciro Castillo, one of the most famous cases that we had in the last years of, of the history no, of let's say of the criminal cases of Peru no, or the you know incidents that have moved the heart of Peruvians deeply. So we have to go now back to January 2011, right? So this couple, they were just starting with a relation. And as a way to reaffirm that relation, they decided to travel together. They uh, decided to go on an adventure that will take them for several months to visit different parts of the country, the jungle, the Andes. So this will be an adventure that will involve trekking, going to national parks. So what a beautiful thing. I imagine myself even in a situation like that one. I have had so in my life as a tour guide the opportunity of traveling even with a boyfriend, right? So uh, what a beautiful way also to reaffirm that love. So that adventure started in January, right? at the beginning of January 2011. They traveled to different locations in Peru, as I said before. But there was a problem. After some weeks, you know, of adventure, after weeks of adventure, they mentioned to their parents of course, independently, their parents didn't knew themselves because this was a very young relation, you know, that they will go to Colca and they wanted to go to continue their trekking. But the information was very general, like nothing in detail. They didn't say what path we will take. It was just adventure, right? So, well, uh, as you can see here in the banner, right? The last time Rosario Ponce and Ciro Castillo were seen together was on March 31st, 2011. And that is because their plan was, first of all, going to a town at the entrance, let's say, of the, of the trekking section of uh, Sendero, we will say, in Colca Canyon, and then beginning uh, for several days the trekking. They called their relatives saying what they will do. They were seen in the town and then they were no more seen. On April the 4th, of course, already several days after you know, they, they started uh, the, the trekking there, the students were reported missing because in theory, the parents of, of this, um, this couple, they said, you know, that they received information initially from them that in a couple of days, they will be back into civilization. But nothing, nothing was known from them, right? So at this point in the story, this couple had four months of relation. So they were very, very, you know, like a, having a very new relation, right? In the flower of the, you know, of, of the of the sensations of any any in love couple will have, right? So well, in the beginning, the news, you know, about this this uh, this this missing couple didn't even escalate it yet to television. But little by little, you know, two young people disappear in, in a let's say, very uh, wild and, and very high and very cold location, it started to call little by little the attention of the media. So we know, for example, that on April the 5th and the 6th, Rosario Ponce, she had a cell phone, right? 
And we're talking about 2011, so nothing like big technology or GPS location in the cell phone. But she texted a friend of hers from the university, Efrain Matos, saying in several of her texts, her last texts, uh, that they were, you know, lost. Uh, and she insisted a couple of times more that they were still lost. And in her last message, she texted Efrain saying, hurry up. They haven't found me yet. And I emphasize the me because it's quite strange. Many people, oh, the, the, the judgment of people later, started to see in the texts of her or in the way how she even presented you know, the, um, when she was invited to television, you know, how selfish she looked oh, um, for being, you know, a, an in love person, right? So, well, the days pass, and here we have a picture about the finding of Rosario Ponce on April 13th. Uh, we're talking about nine days after they were reported missing and several days after they began the adventure, she was found it in a cave, in a zone that was far away from the original sendero or pathway they wanted to take uh, to in that section in the Colca Canyon. So, of course, they were lost, right? So we can see her. In a, in a really bad state, um, burned by the sun. Her eyes were damaged by the glare of the light up there in the mountains, which is the radiation also very extreme. She was not able, of course, to consume food for a prolonged time, but Ciro was not there. So the family of Ciro was in a moment, you know, happy to see her alive. They have hopes that he will still be alive, but also extremely worried about where is the my son? No? So here you can see also one of the first pictures made, uh, a, let's say a, a front face picture of Rosario Ponce, showing, of course, the, the marks of, the sunburn, dehydration, uh, and indeed, you know, the damage in, in the eyes, in the routines of the eyes also uh, that were caused by the light. So we're talking about several days of her, you know, not being able to consume properly liquids or to eat properly. When she was consulted about Ciro, of course, the first thing people ask about her, she said that Ciro went to ask for help, went uh, to a place that they saw in the distance that had light, probably like a little town, right? But because they were lost and she was very, you know, like a ill and, and she was weak, she couldn't keep going. So he... A man who has also been always recognized among his friends as a very helpful man, very, very good to women also. He said, no worries, Rosario, stay here. I'll go to look for help. And he put on layers of clothes, even uh, the gloves of Rosario, a hat from Rosario, and went away. The problem started when the policemen tried to know when exactly Ciro left her, right? Because remember, they gone, they were missing officially on the 4th of April. They were actually seen last time on the 31st of March, right? And she was founded on the 13th of April, right? So this means that you know, there are several days very important to know the state of Ciro. 
And she first said to some of the people who rescued her that she saw him, you know, like, a, let's say, three days before to another person a couple of days ago and to other person five days ago. So she didn't really knew exactly when it was the last time she saw him. Okay. She also said that they both were not able to eat for days, for days uh -huh, uh, together. Right. And that's why also he went to look for food and help. So, she lived without food at least for 11 days, food and proper water, right? So, of course, everybody was surprised. It was a miracle. But how can she was able to survive like this? So, Rosario said that she survived by eating insects, water from rain, and even her own urine in the last days before she was founded because those days didn't rain in the Colca Canyon, right? And of course, this, this lady, she was an expert trekking, or at least she was way better than many people would be in this situation. She trekked for time, right? And Cito, even more, right? So they knew how to take care of themselves for some days. But still, people were very, you know, surprised because the physical state of that lady didn't look as bad as if she didn't really eat for so long, right? Also, uh, another thing important, and this is for later, for the future, because my dear friends, Ciro Castillo didn't make it. But in the necropsy of Ciro, in the body of Ciro, was noted, was discovered that there was still food, in his stomach, you know, that was eaten at least 10 hours before his death. So this means that, unfortunately, you know, someone is lying. You know, he had food already in his stomach, okay? So very strange. She said also she bleed for 13 days. You know, we're talking about something related probably with a menstrual disorder. But when, and that, that was the reason of her extenuation. And that's why Ciro went away to look for, for help. But in her hemoglobin exams, the level of the hemoglobin in her body was okay. It didn't really show, you know, this state. So this fragile state. So, well, the family of Ciro in the desperation of finding the days pass, the weeks pass, the months pass, they didn't found in this lady even support for going to for knowing or helping to to look for Ciro. She rejected in many occasions supporting the work of you know like um, going to the mountains and and, and help. Uh, to find him. Uh, of course, she always said that it was because she was psychologically touched and she didn't want to return. But in many ways, she didn't look like a in love woman. And that's what people, the general opinion, started to notice. And from being the miracle, the finding of Rosario, it turned into being sort of like an evil person. Right. So, well, now that we are in this moment of the story, I want to tell you also that the body of Ciro Castillo was discovered on October the 20th of the same year, 2011, in the depths of an abyss, very snowy abyss, in a mountain or at the bottom of a mountain called Bomboya. So I would like to go to the second 40 of this video because I want to show you. The uh, the video of the finding of the body of Ciro Castillo. You can see 
how complicated the landscape is. You know, if you're not an expert climber, Andinist, you should not be going in that direction. We know for sure this was not something planned by Ciro or Rosario. No? They were experts in, in trekking, but they were not even prepared for this type of conditions. So you can see the body being taken out from this, let's say, slope. I have a question from Anne. How long after she was found? Uh, oh, excellent question, Anne. So on April 13, Rosario was found. And on October the 10th, the body of Cito was found. How far from her? Oh, I'll show you a map in a moment, amiga. I'll show you a map. Thank you also for your questions and for using the queue. It helps me a lot. <laughs> so look at this. Look at these conditions, no? So, well, of course, lots of theories started to emerge. And we're going now to go back to to the um, our slideshow. Just give me a second. We're going back to the slideshow. Mm -hmm. So for this moment, before the finding of Ciro Castillo, the family Castillo decided to accuse formally Rosario of murder. So the general opinion before the finding of the body of Castillo, Ciro Castillo, was inclined to believe that she was guilty. But it was not just the fact that she was not collaborative, cooperative with the finding, you know, that sometimes she looked like she knew how she died. She always said, well, she slept, uh, he slept, he, he, he fall, you know, like without really knowing that, you know, and, and, and it was very strange. Like she knew, but she didn't knew, right? So, but well, uh, before we go also no, to, to the theories, because I want to present to you four theories of the death of Ciro Castillo, I want to tell you also that Eloy Katya was an adventure guide of Arequipa, expert in this, you know, like landscapes. He leads tour groups to Coke Canyon, Actually, my husband met him. No? So uh, this person is now a legend because he was the one who was able to find after so many months. So remember, April, May, June, July, August, September, October. We are talking about six months in total, right? Missing, right? So... This man insistently tried to find him and finally he was the only one. Not even the most expert people were able to find, even paid people were able to find the body. But there was a reward from the father of Ciro, Dr. Ciro Castillo Rojo, right? What condition was the body after six months? Larry, great question. Saponification is the condition of the body. It turned into, you know, something, a mix of fat that was exposed also. And it's the same condition that mummies in the Andes, these ancient mummies of princesses, chosen women that were discovered in the mountains, in the peaks of the mountains in the Andes, you know, were discovered. And that's also how the body remain in good condition because of the cold conditions uh, um, and the elevation. Mm -hmm. So the problem if Rosario tried to keep the, her emotions under control, aha, uh -huh, but it made her appear, yes, lethargy. And you will see, my friend, 
also some videos that are very contradicting. Like she was seen later as a femme fatale, uh, as a as a person, a heartless person. Like she tried to control, you know, her emotions, but. I think it ended up like, especially in a society like the Latin American society, in which emotions are always, you know, out there. You know, something like that is very unusual. So this is a little bit of the of the map, amigos. I want to share with you because I remember also our friend Anne wanted to to know the route. So just give me a second. I'll take a pen. I'll take a pen and show you what was the direction. So here you can see. <laughs> and thanks for your question again, huh? So this is the route. Follow the first two days. Uh, here. I was trying to find exact like kilometers, you know, but I was not able really to find the, the length in kilometers. But we're talking about really why like this is like a lagoon. This is a town. This is the whole length of a town. You know, so if this town has, let's say, approximately five kilometers, so you have an idea of how big, you know, the first part, the two days trek was. And then this is where the problem happens because they wanted to take a route to a place called Tapai. And this was the route they should have followed. But instead, they mistaken the route and they went here this direction right so we have here you know the mountains they continue lost here and we have in this section the yellow line we have the route that took rosario you know rosario ponce uh, uh, to the place where she was discovered the number two Oh, the cave, right? Also, there is a place called the place of the backpacks, Lugar de las Mochilas, where they left backpacks. Hmm? And then we have this place, the number three, is where Ciro was founded. So really few kilometers from the section of the backpacks that also Rosario said, well, he must be around that section, no? But, you know, she she really didn't help much. Um, probably she could, maybe not, but at least she didn't have that much predisposition. Uh, or at least that's what the public opinion said, right? So we'll continue now. And we're going to talk about the theories about his death, his murder, if that was the case. And there are several theories, amigos. I've been able to find like eight theories about his death. So imagine how popular uh, uh, this case was. But uh, there is something important. is the perception of people about a case playing a very important role for the let's say the justice because sometimes when the when the justice is influenced by the general opinion you know the justice has to be blind right but sometimes it's not oh gracias sara thanks for your tip support amiga muchas gracias so now we're going to uh, begin with the first theories right and before we go to the first theory, you know, let me tell you something. Oh, Rosario commented in some, you know, like a television programs, certain things about Syria, like Ciro, no? In 2012, before, you know, we, we knew, oh, uh, like, let's say about his death, she started to present in many television programs, no? And she gained antibodies <laughs> because she was very you know like a poker face always and people wanted to ask her if she cried like because she never even show emotions she said in many cases no no uh, i i only uh, cry for my son like she had by the way a son five year old son and you know that was 
in a way also the reason why people like she fall from the grace of people because a lady that was a young mother uh, unmarried young mother remember we are in latin america uh, so nothing against that <laughs> but latin america young mother teenager mother actually that you know she abandoned her four-year-old son to go on an adventure with a new boyfriend you know many people started to complain oh, what's this you know she said for example in one occasion that he slept and because well he didn't have the necessary equipment to practice mountaineering right so if she don't she don't dies because he slept she said uh, he made a decision not to go correctly equipped to the mountain uh, as it should be I want to clarify that there is no third person here, she said, because she knew the father of Ciro not just appointed her as a as murder, uh, like a, as, a, as a victimary of, of the murder, also that she had the help of someone else. Thank you, Larry. Gracias, amigo. Okay. Uh, even Mr. or Dr. Ciro Castillo, the father of Ciro Castillo, he appointed the ex-boyfriend and father uh, of the ex-boyfriend uh, of, of uh, Rosario as uh, the people who murdered his son, right? So very, very hard accusations. So it's not, not something to, to be taken, you know, like a lightly. But people started to form their criteria about this, and it became very important later for the four uh, theories of his death. So, of course, the first one will be the first theory that I would say if we go ask to the Peruvian people about the case of Ciro Castillo, everybody remembers the case. What do you think happened to Ciro Castillo? People will say, Rosario Ponce killed him. I am sure 95% of people will say that. Okay, so we're going now to uh, to this part, but I would like to answer Anne's question. She didn't make a formal statement until three months after, and she avoided a lot to talk to the media. And also, in a way, the me media can be very pushy. Of course, we have to put sometimes in the shoes of everybody, you know? So uh, uh, later, you know, years after, uh, she said that, the, the media said that if you don't help us, you know, you're going to look bad in, in front of, you know, the, the, the audience, you know, the general opinion. And that will not be good to you. So she sort of like was a little bit stubborn. That's what she said in a way. And, and she didn't want because she said that, you know, she knew people had already formed their opinion about her. So she just try to present to the audiences and to the, you know, like a, to the justice in front of the justice, to the prosecution, right? Um, so, but the father of Ciro Castillo, Dr. Ciro Castillo, he went to all the televisions, uh, at all the programs, so, and, and he accused her time after time, directly saying that she killed C Ciro. Uh, maybe she pushed Ciro or uh, accusations that were also very hard. You cannot do that without any proof. But he had the support of the general audience uh, and people. Uh. So, for example, on July 15, Mr. Ciro Castillo accused her of murder before the body of Ciro was founded and before an autopsy, autopsy could be done in the body, right? Did she have formal medical issues? Marianne, we will talk about that too. I promise. We will talk about that. Uh, and, and maybe the end of this story will be even more surprising. <laughs> if Rosario was innocent, she certainly didn't help herself. Yes. Yes, for sure. Let her do. Did Rosario have family nearby? Always. Always. Uh, Marianne, Rosario was always supported with her family. That was moment after moment by her side. And that's also a way how she had certain level of strength because she didn't have any other support than her family. 
Vai? Ok, amigos. This is the most clear picture I was able to find of a close-up to the body of Ciro Castillo. Uh, this picture, um, because the other ones were pixelated, the other ones were more like a, difficult to, to use in an event like this one. Uh, and I'm doing this event with the intention of also sharing the story of Ciro. Also, you know, letting you know, letting you know that going to the Andes and traveling, you know, like just, you know, on yourself, it's not really the best decision. You have to go with specialists. You have to go with people who are trained. Things can happen, right? Now it's easier to be connected, you know, but we're talking about 2011, you know, so different times. as well. You know. So this is the way how CETA was founded. And first of all, you know, in the, in the pictures, Uh, of, of them together, the same jacket, the same, you know, clothing, everything matched. Uh, that's how he was also reported missing. Mm. Uh, I mentioned also that the body was in a state of saponification. So sort of like turning into soap. Um, the fat of the body uh, sort of like was modified chemically because of the altitude the sun, the radiation, the elevation, right? Um, the way how he was founded definitely was, you know, like proof of he slept down. He, he fell from a very high elevation. Mm -hmm. We know some sad things about his last hours. And we know, first of all, and then later we're going to know the details, you know, Uh, we know that his suffering was quite long. You know? He probably was there in the bottom of that rock, falling four meters, you know, alive still for about eight hours. Mm -hmm. So, well, this is the condition in which he was discovered. And also, important, the socks and the gloves, because the socks seem in the first instance, like he has walked barefoot. Actually, he didn't have any shoes. So the general uh, belief was that he was made to walk for a long distance without shoes, you know? That was the, the belief. And also the gloves, there was seen three gloves, Three gloves close to him, two of one color and one of other color. So later we're going to talk about the gloves, but immediately people said, you know, someone, someone pushed him, right? So it in a way solidify the denounce from the father of Ciro Castillo. Mm -hmm. um, Cynthia, we're going to talk about that indeed, of course, of course. Oh, and... We're going also to check all the following. Also, we'd like to see Emily has come in. Strange, you mentioned it. Yes, Emily. Yes, Emily. That that message. They haven't found me yet. You know, like the general opinion is, first of all, very egocentric, selfish person because she's talking about her to her, to her friend, but a friend that also knows zero, right? So, Indeed, no? We have to check on this. Also, and here we have lots of fails from the national police and the local investigation you know, office because there was a camera with them and the camera was not solicited uh, because immediately you have to take everything for the person, confiscate everything. But no, when Rosario was discovered, her camera stayed with her for several weeks And then later, she was requested to give away her camera. And, of course, she said she didn't erase any pictures from her camera. That was a lie. There were nine pictures missing uh, in the camera. Okay, so we're going to see the pictures, or some of the pictures. And what happened with the eighth, uh, the, uh, sorry, the ninth, because only eight were discovered. 
Well, we don't know. We will never know about that other picture. Sometimes, you know, like the experts in informatics can recover data, sometimes no. Mm -hmm. So Marianne was his father, an influential person. Uh, Marianne, not, he, uh, not his father, the father of Ciro, I, see, I think you, you are mentioning. Not then, but now, yes. And thanks to this story, he became very important. Now he is mayor. He's a mayor of a, of a, of a city. Mm -hmm. But the father uh, of the, you know, ex-boyfriend of Rosario was a very important person. Uh-huh. So, well, some of the pictures here, pictures that show them in the adventure. This one from the 1st of April. So one day after they communicated with their uh, families. Right. Probably erased because they were blurry, probably erased because well, they were similar. They were very, very alike. So that could be, you know, a reason. Uh, there were many like this ones, right? Replicas. This one here, these two, almost similar from the 3rd of April. And we can see also, you know, the same theme. A little bit dark, very dark. So probably they were erased for that reason but when people started to see these pictures especially the ones in the bottom there was the general belief that there was a third person with them because of the position of the pictures right it seems like someone is taking the pictures this one is one of the pictures that was erased were they both similar? Yes, yes, Marianne. They were uh, university students. They were in their 20s. 23, I think they were both. Mm -hmm. They were. They met in, in the university, in the same classroom. So, yes, Letaji, indeed. No? Many errors that later also create bigger problems. No? So, this is another of the pictures erased. This is a really cute picture. Isn't it? It's from April the 4th, right? They both are still with a smile. So, and then, well, one picture that was erased. So here I want to also bring two other characters to the story. Uh-huh. Yes, Marianne. So also many people commented, you know, is there any possibility, you know, that the another person was with them? And this is actually this guessing is what brings us into this guy over here, Victor Cabrera. So who is Victor Cabrera? Victor Cabrera was an ex-boyfriend, not the father of the son, the five-year-old son of Rosario Ponce. It was another boyfriend uh, that they had some time together, right? They were not just having a few months. They had time together, right? And something curious is that later, the general you know, knowledge you know, was that the person who was the lawyer, the defensor of Rosario Ponce, was the father of her ex-boyfriend, right? So uh, there were lots of speculations about that, you know, very interesting. You know, how come, you know, these families are still together and, you know, drama started to appear and people started to point him as the possible third person that was with them. So, well, then later, you know, uh, when he was addressed also, his cell phone was requested, but not with a formal judiciary order, you know, to, to be presented, the cell phone of this boy, you know, Victor, to see if they had communications, before, you know, during the time she was lost. She refused to give his phone. But she said he was not there with them because he was working here in Lima, in Miraflores. And he had many people that had seen him working those days. So no ways that he could be there. But there was a lot of a speculation about the relation of them. And the, the media asked them, asked him if they were together. And, and he didn't want to answer the questions. 
he didn't, he refused to answer questions, okay? Well, I want you to have your own conclusions about the personality of this lady. And I will also play another video in which, of course, it's in Spanish. It's a video uh, that was made to her few weeks after she was, you know, like uh, rescued. She already was fed. Ciro was, uh, let's say, uh, no, no, sorry. This one was after Ciro was discovered. After Ciro was discovered. Sorry, sorry. Because in this video, she says, you know, like, and that smile you see there is from the video. When she was, you know, consulted about what she felt about the family accusing her, the family Castillo accusing her of being the murder, she said, "Oh well, you know, I am not the person. I, I don't, I don't hate them. I understand them, but it's not my fault that he he fell because he just failed." And she started to laugh. So let me show you this, okay? She's saying that she trusts in justice, but she feels that the family of Ciro has put everybody against her. We're going to jump to the minute, to the second 50, where her reporter asked her about her feelings related with the falling of Ciro. So what, what it says in the last seconds uh, is that, well, he doesn't have no any, any you know, like an implication in the way how the family is treating her, you know, and well, it was a very sad accident and she just dropped, he, he just, you know, felt, you know, you know or slow, um, you know, like a... Um, just roll down, no? Oh, she just, you know, he just dropped, no? And he and she starts to laugh L live, you know, on in television, in national television, right? So, of course, that immediately people started to comment about that nervous smile with no empathy at all for the family of Ciro, you know, and and. You know, and, and looking at everybody, like uh, looking for acceptance, no? Like, well, she just failed. Ha, 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 no? And not just that. Um, so, well, little time after, you know, all of this situation happened, or oh, indeed, Emily, in, indeed, very odd answer. She was asked by, a, you know, like a, a designer, Peruvian designer, to model for for him in a you know like a beneficence you know like a let's say a catwalk and she accepted you know but what a what a strange thing you know like this is her modeling few weeks after the body of Cito was discovered and she's well the family of of Rosario Ponce, she's of course not a model, as you can see, but she was invited, you know, because she was living a moment of fame. And the family of Rosario, of course, supported her. They said that, you know, she just wants to continue with her life. She has the right to do that. Uh, um, she doesn't have to prove she is innocent. Actually, she has to be proven uh, that she is guilty right and that's the mother of rosario and, and she said that because it was a charity purpose rosario couldn't say no right so 
you know, the general opinion was that she was a very cold, um, femme fatale, you know, like a lady. Not necessarily like that, to be honest. No, we have, unfortunately, in Latin America, one opinion of how women should be. You know, like we have this idea of a Marianist mother, and she was a mother. Remember, she had a five-year-old son. You know, that it has to be, mothers have to be, you know, like a loving and giving and, and, and be crying if something is bad. And she didn't cry one single time, not in television, of course. Well, not, nobody really cares in her private privacy, but and in contrary, the mother of Cito cried in every every time she was presented. You know, like a, she was really more the image, the mother of Cito, uh, of of the woman that is suffering, right? So people made their judgment, of course, right? So let me stop the video. This is the person who invited her, the designer who invited her. Sorry. And I'm going to go back to, I hope you are enjoying this event, by the way, amigos. This is the first one of my, a series, a new series about unsolved crimes, which um, are going to take us to the darkest side oh, of, of Peru. Oh. Uh, thanks for the follow, Wendy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lethargy. I really en enjoy sharing this with you. Although, well, it's a sad story. All of them will be sad stories. But um, you're going to understand a different side of Peruvian culture, I think, with this series. Gracias, Lisa. So theory number two. The number one is that she was a, a, the murder uh, of Ciro Castillo. Maybe held by other person, maybe alone, maybe they had a fight, maybe she was helped, you know, like for, for a reason, any reason, you know, to, to kill him, you know, but that's, that's pretty much what people have in mind, right? Human sacrifice. Is that possible that a human sacrifice in the, in the 21st century can happen in Peru? Well, amigos, it is something people consider not completely out of the question, right? The ancient Peruvians, the pre-Hispanic men, sacrificed humans to the gods. And there is still a belief about sacrificing animals, for example, sacrificing products, sacrificing, you know, things to the gods of the Andes. And sacrificing humans, oh, sorry, we're going to, Oh, put down the volume. So sacrificing humans, uh, it could be also considered the ultimate act no, for to, to, to honor the gods, right? Could this be possible? It is not the only case of reported human sacrifices and disappearances of people and, and connections with human sacrifices in Peru in these times. But this happens, you know, in the most remote locations but remember this place was very remote right so many people also speculated that he could be uh, a, a human sacrifice but the other theory was that he was killed by miners the zone where he was reported missing is a zone where illegal mining happens mining of minerals such as silver for example or gold and many of these mines, because they are illegal, they are not, you know, like, um, let's say, a register, they should be kept like that. Um, well, my husband, he's also a trip leader. He travels a lot to Arequipa. He mentions me that when he traveled to Arequipa uh, after the disappearance of Ciro, the people from the town where he was seen you know, last time, mentions that they also believe he could have been spotted by miners, uh, illegal miners, and disappeared, you know, for not spare, spreading the information. Oh, so, well, this was sort of like gossip, but it could happen. It could be, this is a theory. Um, well, also, miners themselves commit different types of ceremonies, to have gold 
to have to find gold, to find silver in the mines, uh, precious metals. There still is a tradition of a genie or a, or a goblin from the mountains called Muki. The Muki is a famous goblin uh, believed to be existent uh, um, by the miners. And the miners give presents to the Muki, sacrifices in some cases. Mm -hmm. And they said that if the Muki is pleased, they are going to be given in return minerals. And finally, last but not least, indeed, because the last theory is the one that prevailed for the justice in Peru. It was an accidental death. Uh, the autopsy of the body and the necropsy uh, of the body revealed some interesting things that, of course, nobody could know um, until the body appeared, and, and it took time also to do the investigation of the site where um, he was founded. And also when it was done, um, sort of like a recopilation, uh, a recreation of the last hours of Ciro Castillo, right? So here you have the necopsy. I tried to done a translation into English. So let me read some of the most important parts. So uh, the medical examination of the body finally uh, mentions that the cause of death uh, of the body of Ciro Castillo Rojo was severe multiple trauma, right? He suffered multiple fractures in his body. Uh, and the body shows fractures in arm, in clavicle, in head, uh, in the face as well also. Ribs were uh, fractured, you know, and basically all the right side of the body. Also in the same necropsy, it was discovered that uh, the stomach of Ciro and the intestine of Ciro still had food. So meaning that he was able to, to eat something before uh, he uh, died. Uh, and finally, and the saddest part to me to, to say, because every time I remember this story, I imagine Ciro. I, I don't really think too much in, in Rosario. I think in Ciro. And, and Ciro probably lived for about eight hours or 10 hours after he slept, right? So the fractures... Thanks for the following, Emily. The fractures in his body uh, didn't kill him. Probably, you know, this man suffered this agony for hours, but he was not able, and probably he screamed out like the most he could, but that sound was so remote that nobody really could um, hear him. No, and and of course he died from the fractures and the internal bleeding, but it, it was indeed a sad death, right? So how was the, the final recreation? Hola, Mike. <laughs> Thanks for joining. So how was the sort of like a, the recreation of the last hours of Ciro Castillo? So first of all, is believed that he was walking for a long time already, you know, like he left uh, Rosario, his girlfriend behind, and he was very tired, right? So he took off his shoes uh, because, of course, after walking, that's what most of us do when we trek, right? So uh, he took off his shoes and, and just to stretch a little bit the legs and the feet, of course, his feet were very sweaty, Right. Uh, and seems in that moment that he was sitting in a zone that was very narrow, very, very narrow. But, you know, it's still stable in that moment. You know, look, look at the view. Right. Look at the view, like uh, something like this. Right. So not really like wide, but it's still, you know, like flat enough for sitting. Right. So here there are a couple of theories, two of the most famous that the, the people who were studying the body said is that number one, maybe one of his shoes dropped down and nobody that is a trekker can walk without proper shoes in the Andes. So probably he trying to grab his shoe, broom, he fell down like this four meters, you know, like almost vertical. 45 degrees, right? 
and he couldn't really like, uh, you know, go back, you know. Another reason could be that while he was seated, once again, you know, he took off his shoes. He also took, uh, you know, like his gloves, probably, right? He took off all the gloves and a rock fall down over him and that made him lose his, you know, like stability and he fell down because of that rock coming. Right. The reason of the three gloves is because probably one of them, you know, was the regular glove and the other one was the inside of the glove out and the other glove, you know, out too. So it looked like three gloves, but in reality were two only. Um, so the anthropological analysis of the circumstances of the dead wants that the pattern of injuries found in the skull is consistent with a violent impact to the head associated with fractures in the facial bones in response to the abrupt desalarization against the rock. So showing that he initially felt very fast, but because his body, you know, was, you know, like going, especially on his right side, right? Um, you know, and, and he was, you know, against the wall of rock. He started to fall little by little, little by little. This this desalarization, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing it well, but going slower, slower until there was a rock that we call in Spanish saliente, which was out and there he stay, but already, you know, all fracture, you know, in, in conditions in which he probably was, was really not able to be safe, even, even, you know, if he was discovered on, uh, at the time he fell. So this is the mother of Ciro Castillo, one of the, indeed, one of the persons, if not the, the, the one that suffered the most, the loss of Ciro. Her mother was also called Rosario. And unfortunately, she's no longer with us. She died from a heart attack in 2016. And here in my last image that I will show you, share to you all in a moment, I want you to probably you are imagining already what happened with Rosario, you know, Rosario Ponce. Like she's sort of like lost from, from everywhere, right? Um, so when I was making this special event for you all, I started to look about Rosario, how she's doing now. So let me tell you what she's doing now. Do you recognize this gentleman over there? Who recognizes this gentleman, please? Yes, Marianne, do you remember who he was? <laughs> uh, Victor Cabrera, the ex-boyfriend. Muy bien, Lethargy. Muy bien, Casey. The ex-boyfriend, right? They got married. They got married in 2015. They have now together two children, uh, plus her other children. She's mother of three boys, right? Anyways, amigos, I really hope you enjoyed this event. It extended more than I thought, but, you know, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Um, it was, a, you know, quite a big investigation I've done for you all. Um, but I'm very, very passionate about this, this new series uh, that is related with these criminal cases of Peru. And also, as always, every time I finish one of my events, I upload my events on my YouTube channel. Because I don't do them again, you know, I, I like to always cover something new. When I am at home, I like to talk about something different every time. So if you would like to see this event from beginning to end to this moment, jump to my YouTube channel. You can go to my YouTube channel easily. Uh, you can later go to my Hago channel. There you're going to see a link that will take you immediately to my YouTube, also to my Facebook if you want to follow me on Facebook or Instagram, uh, which is going to be a pleasure if you can give me a, a follow on, on YouTube and help me to, you know, uh, to grow a little bit also over there. That would be super. 
Also, thank you so much to the people who were able to support. Gracias, Casey, querida. Thank you. Thanks for your tip support because, as you know, uh, uh, this is the only way how we um, content creators and tour guides can continue also creating events for you all. And also, when you are supporting with, um, let's say, a tip or becoming a sponsor, uh, you are helping Hago to continue being a free platform. Many free platforms that began with the pandemic uh, are now gone and we are all working very hard for Hago to continue existing number one and number two being a free platform uh, as it has been always so thanks a lot for that gracias Philip thank you thank you uh, also if you would like to support me to create more events uh, and maybe let's say with a, a, a sort of like more uh, compromise you know with, with my channel please consider to become my sponsor with a $10 fee. You can help me a month. You can help me to create events permanently. Uh, so it's like a Patreon system, you know, it's, it's a sponsor, we call it. And as a way of, you know, giving you something back, uh, I am also giving two private Zoom classes uh, of Spanish to my sponsors to practice Spanish with me uh, and also access to books that I'm writing here uh, because I love writing. So, <laughs> um, well, they are still in progress, but you can get uh, looks into these books. One is a cookbook and the other one is a guidebook of Lima. Thank you so much, amigos. Gracias. Mwah. I really appreciate your support and your company as always. And please keep Ciro, as Marlene says, in your thoughts. Uh, and now, well, the family, no? The family um, indeed passed through a very, very hard time. Um, so it's been already long. Uh, and, and we just hope that they can, you know, continue their lives. Because at the end, we are going to meet all, you know, up there. Oh, in, in the in the afterworld, in the afterlife. Oh, so well, see you soon, amigos. Gracias. Thank you so much. And if you would like to donate, I will activate a button that will help you how to do it. You know, you can even do it after we finish this event. So you don't need to hurry up in this moment. Uh, thank you so much and see you very soon. Gracias, amigos. Gracias, gracias, Marianne. Thank you. Have a lovely rest of the day and see you very soon. Bye-bye.